housing affordability as climate policy. With the explosion of demand and various obstacles on the supply side, the affordability of rental and purchase housing in Canada has become a serious issue for greater and greater numbers of Canadians. The need for more housing is also a need for more climate-friendly housing, meaning reduced GHG emissions and greater resilience to extreme weather events. So can we have greater access to more affordable housing that is also more climate friendly, or must we choose between those two objectives? Are there trade-offs? Are they complementary? What's the story? That and other things are going to be talked about on this panel. Uh, and our moderator has become Mr. Housing in Canada, Mike Moffat. Mike is the founding director of the Place Centre at the Smart Prosperity Institute. PLACE is an acronym. It stands for Propelling Locally Accelerated Clean Economies. Quite snappy, quite snappy. Propelling Locally Accel... Good, good. Propelling Locally Accelerated Clean Economies. And his work at the PLACE Centre focuses on the intersection of regional economic development, building climate-friendly housing in communities, and clean innovation. So Mike and company, come on up. Thank you. So we put out, a group of us got together uh, recently and put out uh, the blueprint for more and better housing that, that looks at these, these issues. But I already know what's in that blueprint. You can kind of Google it if you want. Um, so I'm going to go one at a time and ask. One of the things that came up a lot when we were working on this blueprint and going out and, and talking to people about the intersection for housing and climate is I think there's a, a belief among the general public that these things are fundamentally at odds with each other. They're like, well, if you're going to build more homes, of course that's bad for the climate because there's material use, there's land use, there's emissions from this and that. So I'll, I'll start uh, with, with Rachel. Uh, from the Institute of, of, for Research on Public Policy. How do you see the intersection between housing and climate? Well, over the past year, uh, we've been working with the Affordability Action Council on this question, we, and we've really focused on the low-income side of the spectrum, um, recognizing that there is an affordability crisis right now, um, and uh, a real dichotomy in terms of what we're seeing between high income uh, people who and homeowners who have been gaining wealth and the low income side of the spectrum and, and renters um, that are continuing to, to lose uh, every month. You know, they're going more into debt, they're not able to afford housing, they're not able, and when, if they are paying for housing, they can't afford uh, food at the end of the month or utilities or transportation or all those things. So there really is an affordability crisis. But at the same time, we can't, um, you know, the reason we got into this situation in the first place is because we weren't thinking long term and we weren't thinking across different policy issues. And we can't do the same thing for the future at this point. We know um, the climate is changing. And we know that we have to reduce emissions, um, hopefully to net zero by mid-century. And so if we're not building housing today that is well suited to those things, then we're setting up uh, a future affordability crisis as well. So what we need is lasting affordability, and that means tackling both the affordability crisis and the climate crisis at the same time. So, and, and I know Steve has a, a framework uh, that uh, looks, you know, includes affordability. So we, we were talking earlier this morning about your three-part framework. So Steve, could you walk us through that? Yeah, I hope it's not too um, pedantic. <laughs> but I like to think of um, affordability problems in, in sort of three, three categories. Because it, there's a lot of nuance when you're talking about housing affordability. People mean different things. Um, the first category, uh, is 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 sort of chronic housing affordability that's caused by uh, the distribution of wealth and income in our society. So aff housing affordability as a consequence of poverty, basically. Um, and this is an issue that persists, unfortunately, permanently in this country. 
um, and requires a set of government interventions that are different than the other kinds of affordability. It re requires things like social supports, social housing, income supports. Um, there are different ways to de deal with this problem, but it requires permanent ongoing government assistance. The second category is the, the one that's prominent now, which is an imbalance of supply and demand in housing markets. So housing supply is, over the short term, very inelastic. You can't build housing rapidly. And even if, when you, even if we wanted to, we can't build housing any faster. There are too many constraints in our supply system and our labor system in the land, in the supply of land for de developable land, all, all of the things that everybody's talking about n now. So when you get a, a, um, a demand shock, prices go up. That's what's happening. Um, these, in, and, and, and this is a relatively short-term phenomenon. It can be cleared with changes in that uh, demand or increases in supply, but as I just said, changing su supply is, is, is hard in the short term. Although it can be done through, and we can get into this perhaps, and it was in, this, you, you mentioned it in your report uh, uh, quite extensively actually, the things you can do short term to, to use your supply better, and that has a climate implication. The third category is, is, is a cost one, which is that in, in, in re, that we, we are in many ways building in long-term high cost, we, we are building long-term high cost environments. We're building communities and housing that, that uh, is, is costly to maintain, is costly to service, uh, costly to provide public services to. Its infrastructure is, is expensive and heavy and, uh, and uh, um, uh, carbon intensive and expensive to replace eventually. And we're locking people into high cost lifestyles and high carbon lifestyles. Th that is a different kind of affordability. It's also sort of chronic if you can think of it that way. But it's, it's, it's a consequence of physical decisions we've made around the, the type and, and, and location of, of the housing that we build. This is where most of the climate effects are in, in the sense that, uh, that households' ability to reduce their carbon footprint has a lot to do with the type of housing that they live in physically and their location on the climate change mitigation side. On the adaptation side or on the climate risk side, uh, this is where we think about f flooding um, uh, to some extent, fire and, 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 and heat, in the sense that these, these things can be mitigated largely through better, better community planning and, and, better f and, and, and more foresight in, in, the, in the design of the housing. So that's very long-winded, Mike, but that's, uh, that's the sort of three buckets that I like to think about. When, when thinking about affordability. Oh, that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm an academic, so obviously I, I love frameworks. I absolutely love frameworks. Uh, and we know, you know, you mentioned that supply demand imbalance and, and the CMHC tells us that we're about three and a half million homes short to return back to the supply demand balance in uh, that we had just 20 years ago in, in 2004. So, so Philip, you know, as, as the, the guy running uh, in charge of sustainability for Mattamy Homes, uh, how do you think about that? How do you see that intersection of, you know, needing to build more homes, but doing so in a way that is uh, accords with our uh, climate ambitions as a country? It's not an easy question to answer, uh, by no means. And I think I find myself in an industry that is lived in a, a bit of a legacy framework for quite some time now that quite honestly doesn't really work in the intersection we're seeing right now between affordability and sustainability. Mattamy Homes is Canada's largest home builder, but we're single percent on new builds. Like we are by no means a 50% of new builds in Canada. So our attempts to do more sustainable, more affordable homes will help the industry, but by no means is it gonna turn the tides overnight. And so what we're finding is in a fragmented industry like ours, historically, there's been a lot of like one-to-one -one interactions we like to say, so we'll deal with the municipality, they'll have some requirements, we'll you know try to adhere to them, then we'll deal with other stakeholders, maybe utilities, and it always is kind of 
seen as we're, we're the facilitator of a lot of decisions. But quite honestly, a lot of builders in our, in our country, they're good at building homes. They're not good at this policy stuff. They're not good at this innovation, forward thinking. They, they need the support to be able to execute on. And quite honestly, a lot of them don't have teams like a sustainability team to spend time researching and looking into these things. And so they kind of get to their permits or get to their drawings and they're ready to go. And then all of a sudden they get asked to do all these new things that they quite frankly don't really know how to do or haven't done before. And so I find how we've set up the industry for the broader industry has worked for the last hundred years building. Uh, we've always built by as we continue to see more and more pressure to build more sustainable homes, the industry that quite honestly is, is a facilitation of a lot of decisions is finding itself hard to keep up and finding it hard to deliver. Because honestly, the best scenario in all of this is our future homes are ultimately gonna be like drawdown homes. Like these homes could potentially be carbon sinks. These homes could be gasless or, or zero emissions. It all is possible. The technology exists today. It's just the industry right now isn't set up to be at the pace of, I think it's you know a quarter million homes is our average start right now. I, I can tell you a quarter million homes right now, it's gonna take a while to build three and a half million and to build them so that we don't have to retrofit them in 10 to 15 years is an even harder challenge right now. So we do find ourselves in a bit of a push and a pull scenario. And we at Mattamy, we're trying to balance the equation of, you know, how much embodied carbon is going into our homes on day one when we hand that key over, but how much is that home gonna emit over the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years? And, and it is a bit of a balancing act right now. And the science is only really come to light in the last five, 10 years. We've been doing energy efficiency in Canada for a very long time and we'll continue doing energy efficiency, but now we've added this layer of carbon. And so it took our industry 30 years to understand energy efficiency. And now we've given them seven years to understand carbon. And it's, it's been an interesting journey for us talking to other builders, trying to do our own education. Um, but when you tell them, you know, that uh, XPS foam has a lot of embodied carbon, maybe try an NGX or maybe try some wood fiber, they kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? I just want to put insulation on my house to make it more energy efficient. So we'll continue our own education, but we have a lot of these conversations with, like I said, the stakeholders we interact with. And it is a bit, you know, we can go from one municipality to the next in the GTA, have similar but very different conversations about what affordability or sustainability means to them. So, so on, on this, and I'm, I'm going to change up the, the speaking order, and I, this may throw curveballs uh, at at my panel, but that, that keeps it exciting. Um, when when uh, you know we look at the, these climate issues, we I think we have to think of both mitigation and, and adaptation on this, right? So it, it, it's both a, an emissions side and also making sure that the, these homes are resilient to um, to the effects of climate change. And as we were working on the blueprint, um, and again, we love frameworks. So my colleague, Sharice uh, Berta of TMU, who is absolutely fantastic, came up with this framework about how we can think about the, these issues. Um, and it's basically the, the same questions you often get asked by a three-year-old, where, why, how, what kind of questions. So I want to talk about the where for a moment, right? That if we look at both adaptation and mitigation, that where piece becomes very important, right? Where you build homes affects their climate resiliency, but it also affects emissions, particularly from transportation. And it also affects what gets built. And we heard uh, there were comments today about by Premier Ford uh, about you know fourplexes and and you know what could get built where. So I'm gonna again change it up. I'm gonna go to Steve because you did mention the this sort of where question. How do you think about that? How do you think about you know the types of uh, policy tools and initiatives we need? So we're building homes in the right types of homes in the right places. Um, so that we're, again, meeting those adaptation and, and mitigation needs. It's one of these questions that's so simple to answer in a few <laughs> words, but then so incredibly complex when you actually <laughs> think about it. Um, uh, okay, so there's some easy answers to, the, to part of it. On the adaptation side, don't build in floodplains. It sounds so simple, but we keep doing it. Uh, 
10% of Can the Canadian housing stock is in high risk flood areas, 10%. Um, of that 10%, the majority of the homeowners don't know. Uh, so w w we're not very good at this. And we keep building, there's lots of brand new housing that gets flooded every year in Canada. Um, that's a simple answer to, the, to, to one part of adaptation or re resilience. But it's, it, it, it shouldn't be that hard to, to solve at least that problem. Stop building in floodplains. Um, but to, 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 to address the real seriousness of this question, um, uh, we, we need more, more density. This is an obvious thing. It's, it's, it's well discussed. Uh, uh, we, we, we need to build denser housing. We need much more infill housing, much more dense infill housing. That doesn't always mean high rises. We have a hard time in North America uh, with, with the in-between, the missing middle, whatever you want to call it, the, 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 high, the medium to high density housing that's not high rises. We, we, we struggle with that built form for various reasons, regulatory reasons, planning, um, uh, uh, you know, the, it, we don't have time to get into all the issues about NIMBYism, but it's, a, it's an enormous factor. Uh, but but, but we, we need to keep working on this because that's one of the main solutions is to, is to, is to increase density in our, in our, in our cities. Um, and then when we do greenfield development, and I'm not saying we should never do new greenfield development, we need to develop complete communities that, that offer the opportunity for people to live higher density lifestyles, even in new uh, development, that are more transit oriented and that are more walkable. Again, it's, a, it's, it's, it's almost a trope to, to say that. I, I mean, every planner in the world says that now. Um, and, and many housing people do, do too. But it's, we, we struggle with it. We struggle with the institutional framework to make that happen. We struggle with the, uh, with the provision of public services to go along with that denser housing. Uh, we struggle with you know, even things like pr providing schools, providing good public places for, 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 for people in, in new communities. Uh, these, these things don't just require physical um, uh, uh, buildings and facilities, which we, we're not too, too bad at that part. They also require institutional responses, and that part is, is, is where we, 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 we still struggle. So, um, again, it, it, it sounds so simple, but, uh, but we, we, we have a hard time with it. And we can get into maybe some of the reasons for that, but I want to perhaps let some of the other panelists weigh in on this before we delve more deeply. Yeah, so, so first of all, I, I want to thank you for using the term missing middle, because uh, that's the name of our housing podcast. So please like and subscribe and you can, <laughs> can find us anywhere. So, you know, I, I, I think two thirds of the reason for this panel is just to self promote things. So I'm going to allow Rachel to do that now, uh, because the uh, affordability council work that that uh, that IRPP has been doing is has been absolutely fantastic. So on that sort of affordability piece, because if I hear Steve, and again, this is a question that comes up a lot. It's like, okay, well, if we're restricting land use and building density, that probably means that we're building on land that's quite expensive, then the homes, whether they be rental homes or ownership homes, will be expensive. So how do, you know, how do we both answer that why question in a climate friendly way, but still allow for affordability? Well, part of it is thinking about all the different costs that are involved um, because we tend to focus on the initial purchase price of a home or the rent um, and we're not thinking about the, the transportation costs that some, a family might face in their, in their new home um, and all the costs that the municipality might face in terms of new infrastructure that is required. Um, and you, you know, we have this situation where um, lower income people in particular are moving farther and farther from city centers in order to be able to afford a home or afford the rent. And the transit is inadequate 
um, to those areas. I mean, it's inadequate in a lot of places, but it's particularly inadequate the further out you go. And so you end up in, it, with these extreme commutes, um, a lot of uh, expenditure on transportation costs. And so if, if we're not finding ways to build closer to where people work, closer to uh, amenities that people need or medical care, then we're, we're setting people up for, for uh, on a, a lack of affordability in the long term. And so what we, we need to do is find ways to make housing affordable where the transit is um, or in an area that's walkable or bikeable. Um, but part of that is going to, and you know, we talk about solutions later, maybe in the next stage, but the, you know, we're, we need to have creative solutions to allow that to happen. So, so on that, so, uh, so Philip, particularly from the perspective uh, of a company or a builder developer that does greenfield developments, how, how do you think about this sort of uh, the, this where question? You know, what what should the industry be thinking about, and the rest of us be be thinking about, as far as you know, where we're placing new homes to uh, also deal with our affordability and climate challenges. So there's a couple things I want to maybe come back yeah, on, no. on what the speakers have just said. But on your specific question, we we identified that you know the missing middle and you know intensification was going to be in our future business plan about 15 years ago, and we've actively been moving into the multifamily space for quite some time now, and we've actually seen that as our biggest growth part of our business. So we were predominantly a low-rise builder for the 45 years we've been in business, and the last. 10 years, we've really shifted to balance our portfolio to some of those more uh, denser product. But at the end of the day, um, what we're finding is people want to live where they want to live. You know, I, this is a group of individuals in here that are probably very forward thinking. And I'm just curious, the last time you bought a house, was it decided based on built form or location first? most likely location first, because maybe you want to be close to work or you want to be close to family. And so there is still competing decisions that are even beyond you know, affordability and, and other means. So we're trying to position ourselves in as many locations as we possibly can so that you buy from us if you're looking in that location. But at the same time, we have great relationships in the GTA with our conservation authorities to address the floodplain mapping. We spend a considerable amount of time, upwards of one to four years, working with various consultants to map out floodplains, then set set back. So I find some areas of Canada very mature in that space. It does add a bit more work. It does add a bit more lead time, but you avoid potential issues that you were commenting on, Steve. There are certainly other parts in, in the country that just don't have the resources to do that right now. And so they are still facing those challenges. Um, but I also have another question maybe for the group. When you were buying your last house, how many of you asked how energy efficient that house was? Two, three. So we have uh, probably 50 people in here that are all very forward thinking and maybe less than 5% actually c wondered if their house was energy efficient. And that's one of the struggles we have with affordability is we're trying to educate our homeowners that, you know, our house maybe down the street from our competitor's house is built to a higher building code. It's built to say Energy Star. We've even started building to CHBs and Etsy already. And we're trying to educate them why we've done that for a better high quality home, but also to address the affordability angle because we're trying to demonstrate you will have a lower carry cost. And we've actually done a really good partnership with RBC recently this past year where we showed them some of the math we're trying to do on our side with our consultants where it's like, hey, Typical resale home that's 30, 40 years old. Here's the energy bills, our consultant's model. Here's a new build to an X standard and the anticipated energy bills. And they've now run the numbers and said, hey, there's actually a delta here that we can maybe lean into. And now they offer a greener home mortgage that is available to now anybody in our industry. It was exclusive to Mattamy for a, a couple months, but now it's, it's in the industry now. And that's the success story we wanna have. So, so on that, so, so first of all, um, Thank you for asking the the, the uh, crowd audience uh, the the audience questions. Uh, now the que the audience at some point is going to be able to ask us questions. So not yet, but uh, start thinking about what you want to ask us. So Philip actually very nicely kind of transitioned us from uh, a, the, a why discussion to a what discussion, which is entirely where we're going next. So so Rachel, on that what uh, question, you know, how how do you uh, in IRPP and the Action Council think about that? Think about 
what needs to be built and, and what are the sort of policy levers or, or sort of policy things that we should be thinking about to make sure that what we build uh, is both uh, resilient and energy efficient and, you know, again, accords with our, our uh, net zero ambitions? Well, I think there are two things on the what side. The first is affordability, and there are lots of definitions of affordability, so I'll talk about that. And then um, the second is future fit. Um, and uh, within that future fit, I think there are a number of considerations as well. So on the affordability side of things, um, one of the things that we talked about that may be a bit of a different definition of affordability is rent geared to income. So it's it's not average income, it's not median income um, or you know median rent. This is what can people afford to spend given the income they have. So someone who's on social assistance or someone who's earning minimum wage, what can they afford to pay in rent that still allows them to buy groceries, that still allows them to uh, to have the transportation they need, all of those basic needs. And, and so that's a different conversation, and it leads you to, um, you know, that, that may not be profitable in the, in the current environment. So we need um, governments to be involved. We need not-for-profit uh, organizations involved in the housing conversation. But then on the future fit side of things, that's that lasting affordability. So we need the energy efficiency. We need it uh, resilient. Um, and, and resilience in terms of flooding, but resilience as well in terms of wildfire, in terms of smoke, um, increasing, increasingly uh, air pollution problem, and um, in terms of heat waves and power outages. There are so many things that are coming, coming at us in terms of a changing climate that we need to be thinking about all of those things and what we build too. Um, and, and hopefully we're also thinking about demographic changes too, you know, um, we're aging population, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of different needs in that housing and, and hopefully um, we build things that people want to live in, in the places that are best for overall society. So m maybe that means we need to rethink uh, what some of those, those buildings look like and that they're more attractive for families or for seniors, um, you know, than, than what we've tended to have so far. So out of that, and this is always a challenge with these panels because for every time you say things, like I come up with like 20 questions and then I got to have triage and figure out the, the, the ones I want to go with. Uh, but kind of a two part question uh, for, for Philip uh, out of this sort of future fit part, you know, we know that uh, particularly first-time home buyers and folks like that are, you know, having trouble qualifying for a mortgage or things like that. Um, and, you know, these, even if you have energy savings over time, it might be difficult to, you know, build to a higher standard, whether it be resiliency or, or, um, or energy efficiency. So how do you, you know, how does Madame think about that? And how do you, you know, make sure that people are still able to afford the upfront cost of homes on that. But then secondly, and I actually wasn't going to go here, but I'm just curious for my own edification about how Madame is thinking about these generational turnover uh, or these, uh, you know, uh, changing demographics needs that uh, Rachel mentioned. So it's a great two-part question. Um, so I can say um, really simply on one data point that I always have in my back pocket is we used to build almost... 90% single family and 10% townhomes. We're almost 50-50 now, and a part of it is driven around the affordability. It's it's providing more product that is in that lower price point in the GTA that allows an opportunity for first-time home buyers to potentially enter the market. You know, gone are the days of building a subdivision with 50-foot lots or 60-foot lots. Like, they just don't exist anymore. We predominantly, the largest home we are building moving forward is maybe a 36-footer, maybe. And that's like, we can probably fit a double car garage on it, but usually it's a single. And then it's a 30 footer. And then all the rest is the touch product because we are genuinely trying to provide at least a wide enough price point that you can still have those resales and those mover uppers that are part of our buying demographic as well. You know, if you had one kid and now you have two and you want that bigger house, that's still a part of our portfolio. 
But the downsizers, for sure, the ones that are going from single detached maybe to an attached product now, or those first time home buyers, that's one of the strategies. We've also tried to uh, partner with other organizations that do like land lease models as well. Like we're trying to get creative with the, the mechanisms around it, but it's, it's one of those, there isn't a silver bullet kind of solution, at least we haven't found it yet. So we're expanding our horizon again. We're trying to talk with individuals like, once again, I'll, I'll plug them, RBC. We're having conversations where it's like, hey, can we build a house that is above code? And can we find a financial uh, mechanism that allows us to still offer it at a, say, cost competitive rate as our, as our adjacent seller or builders, but the homeowner doesn't have to bear that premium. Can they have like a zero interest on the green efficiencies or something like that? Like, how can we start shifting the value creation that we're making so that it is still affordable? Um, I think one of the players that really hasn't come to the table fully yet, and I've knocked on the door a couple times, is the utilities. You know, we are electrifying a lot of our homes right now, and we still kind of work in a little bit of a black box. We tell them, here's our community that we're building. We give them the units, the loads. They do some calcs. They tell us what it's going to cost to build infrastructure. And off to the races we go. But as we electrify, for example, you know, we're moving away from natural gas. So hopefully we're protecting people from future increases of carbon tax and things like that because they're more dependent on electricity in Ontario. But the utilities are now having perhaps a more consistent uh, usage of their user profile. So historically, anyone in this room that's had a house, your utility bill for electricity typically spikes in the summer because your air conditioner's going, and then it drops in the winter. And so the utility companies, they have to manage that load and they have to size their infrastructure and so on. However, if we electrify and we move to heat pumps and high efficiency homes, we're gonna see a bit of a peak still in the summer because you still have to cool your house, but now you're gonna see a bit of a peak in the, in the winter as well because now you're heating your home. You're still gonna have those lulls in the shoulder season, but now you have a more continuous consumption. And so we're having conversations with the utility where it's like, how can we benefit that value creation for you where we're creating hopefully a asset to your infrastructure, not a liability. You're not worrying about these 10,000 homes coming onto your grid now. And hopefully that will ultimately translate into something that could uh, contribute to affordability. So, so Steve, the, you know, we, we hear Phil talk about the need for, for creativity, and I think that's, that's absolutely important, and particularly, as Philip pointed out, in an industry that is very, very fragmented, right? We're not talking about a couple players here. So, you know, how, how do you think about these issues, and, and how, you know, what are the sort of creative, innovative ways that we can um, deal uh, with this, uh, this issue of, of being able to both have affordability um, and uh, energy efficiency and uh, low carbon? Um, it's maybe not creative, but it's, um, uh, but, but I think the biggest change that we need to make is to, um, is to change uh, the, 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 the financial uh, aspects of the housing system such that the that, that the full cost of the full life cycle of the housing is reflected in in the transaction and so meaning that that we we need better mechanisms to understand the the life cycle energy cost and carbon footprint of that house um, and simple things can help on this uh, you you mentioned phil the um uh, you know that, 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 that there are some countries in um, in in Europe that make it mandatory to provide an energy rating with the um, with, with with every real estate transaction, not just new homes, all of them. Um, other other things uh, that, that that provide better information to to uh, everyone involved in in the housing transaction um, will, will will help in this regard. Things like like publicly available flood mapping. Um, so, so this flood risk that I talked about is 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 understood and and known, but also um, uh, uh, much more transparency in the costs that that housing is imposing on the municipality, future cost uh, that will eventually be reflected either in property taxes or paid for some other way. Uh, by the municipal government, wh whether it's directly or th or through a transfer from from one of the other governments, um, uh, understanding this better up front would lead to different decisions about the the um, housing. Also, um, the way we 
we we underwrite um, uh, mortgage loans, both for homeowner and rental loans on, on the multi-unit side, um, uh, uh, needs to change, I uh, believe, to 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 have a far greater um, uh, to, to 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 consider these future costs when understanding the current risk of of, of that loan and th th things like um, the 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 cost of of ripping out a natural gas boiler that had a 35 year life and we put it in now in in a multi unit apartment building and has to be torn out 10 years from now and thrown away when we're electrifying well that's that's a pretty poor decision to make now um, but but there's no one's bearing the cost of that in the, in that transaction it's just a theoretical thing um, but if we actually reflected the future energy costs um, or expected energy costs in the 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 valuation of the asset when we underwrite initially that might lead to a different different not a different decision necessarily but a different cost of of, of financing um, Th th those are the main ones uh, that, that that come to mind in the financial aspect of of this, but but some of those are pretty you know significant changes. Um, uh, they 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 require a, a different sort of inf uh, set of information to be exchanged in the transaction, and uh, and 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 hopefully that drives different beh behaviors. Yeah, I find any conversation in Canada eventually, at least among policy wonks, always devolves into a bet we need more data and information type type discussion. I think that's certainly true. Uh, and actually, before I get to the the, the, the next question, um, you know, both uh, both Steve and, and Phil mentioned uh, you know, Phil mentioned heat pumps, and um, Steve, you know, mentioned heating systems. Uh, before I get to the how question, I have to ask you, Rachel, could you walk us through what the Affordability Council is is recommending on, on heat pumps? And I know I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit. No, no, um, absolutely. That's fine. So we we have a brief um, called, well, I mean, there's, there's two of them on housing. One of them uh, is focused on retrofits. And so that talks about um, the benefits that, that we could provide, particularly to low-income households from um, providing free retrofits of their homes that would improve both the energy efficiency, so energy efficient windows, doors, uh, insulation, as well as a, a switch to heat pumps. Um, and part of that, uh, you know, is energy savings, but it's also uh, improving their resilience to what could be increasingly volatile fossil fuel prices down the road. And Steve, you mentioned that a little bit on, on natural gas. I mean, we know as, as the consumer base for natural gas shrinks, we're probably gonna see higher prices. Well, unless there's governments that step in, but um, you know, the, there's a risk there that, that um, the, those that couldn't afford a heat pump in the first place are they gonna be the ones left holding the higher costs of, on fossil fuels. And, and oil prices are likely to be more volatile going forward as well. So um, part, part of the, the goal is um, helping those that can least afford the upfront costs, the upfront capital costs of these types of shifts, helping the government stepping in with that assistance at the beginning in order to make sure that they are the ones that are not bearing the brunt of, of the transition. Because if we leave it to, to the market, it's going to be low-income households that are the last ones to switch, the last ones to shift, and they already tend to live in older, less energy-efficient homes, and they spend a larger proportion of their income on energy costs. So um, if, you know, if we can step in and help them uh, you know, make the shift first, that's going to make the transition much more equitable. And then when we talk about new housing, it's a similar uh, similar situation. If we're building new housing that's hopefully um, geared towards low-income households, we certainly don't want to set them up in a situation where they're going to need a retrofit down the road because their energy costs are too high or, or that we're leaving them vulnerable to those price fluctuations. So heat pumps are a way to, um, 
to have uh, that shift off of fossil fuels and to be more uh, focused on the electricity system and, and potentially have an, a revenue stream as well if the utilities can, can get on board where um, if you have smart water heaters, you have a battery generator, you have a potentially electric vehicle that could um, be a source of, of energy storage and, and power for utilities that benefits them. It reduces their need for, for peaking power plants and um, helps them uh, manage their, their load. So, and these, these are fan fantastic briefs, and I recommend you check them out. And I always forget the URL. Where can we, do you remember it as well, or should we just get them to Google it? Uh, it's just irpp.org slash affordability. There we, there we go, there we go. So, next question is the how question, and we're gonna need to change how we build. Uh, partly, uh, again, just uh, to, to meet our, our climate ambitions and our resiliency ambitions, but also just a matter of scale, right? That, that if we take the, the CMHC recommendation of, or need for 3.5 million homes, even remotely, literally, you know, we're talking about two, uh, a 2x or 3x increase in home building. So uh, I'm going to go to Philip on this first. You know how how has things how have things changed in the sort of how we built over the last generation or so, and um, going forward, you know how do things need to need to change going forward if we're going to meet all of these simultaneous ambitions? Well, I can say majority of houses being built today are the same way they've been built for the last hundred years. It's, it's, you know, it's a crew of people and they're out there with hammers and tools and they're putting it on site. And basically that's, that's as simple as it gets. Obviously there's much more to it, but I would say fundamentally our industry hasn't changed that much. And we're probably one of the last industries that hasn't been disrupted or transformed or whatever verb you want to use because we are such, you know, we've said it before, such a fragmented um, industry that it's it's difficult for one player or company to come in and just change the game overnight because quite honestly, that's just not how the industry is built. And we also have an aging labor force that have been building these homes for the same way for the last 30, 40 years. I don't know if any of you have ever been on a construction site. And if you want to tell an old Italian man how to build a house differently, it's probably not going to go well. Um, and so there is a bit of a transitional generational thing we're dealing with where we're trying to bring on younger individuals that perhaps don't want to be working outdoors in the cold and say, hey, there's other options there's the prefab, there's the panelization, there's modular, there's all this stuff. But once again, we've had conversations with the prefab and the panelization and the modular companies. Mattamy in the 2000s, actually for a handful of years, built entire houses in a warehouse and then we wheeled it down the street and put it on foundations. It was probably way ahead of its time and it financially did not work, so we stopped doing that. But, you know, there is still challenges with the prefab and the panelization sector where you know, I'll give some examples. We will send them architectural files for them to, you know, do their panels off of. And if it's not perfect, then they have to go and rebuild it all. And then, because their software needs certain layouts to be able to manufacture the panels. And then the other problem is, is they don't want to just come and do one house a day. They want to come and do 20 houses a day because that's how quick and efficient they are. Well, guess what? We have to pour 20 foundations. It takes us a couple days to get there going. So what ends up happening is if you were to go to a Mattamy site right now, you'll actually see it's almost like an assembly line. Like you've got an open hole to a finished house and everything in between because crews are literally moving one house over at a time as we're building if you go to like a panelization where they want to come and just do it all in three days well you're going to have 50 homes sitting with concrete in the ground for three four weeks until we get that backlog and then they come to site and do it all so you almost don't gain any time now because you've had to wait three weeks to build up that inventory so there is still kinks in the system that we're trying to work with our partners and a lot of them they're very capital intensive like to start a panelization company you need a huge factory with a lot of capital and you need a pipeline for it and so they're trying to solicit business before they even get the warehouse up and running sometimes because to put in $15 million or $20 million of capital to build a warehouse to then go get business is not going to be very good for a lot of investors, uh, at least when they look at the business model. So I would love to say we're starting to do full modular houses again, but the industry just, it's at that tipping point where you're seeing it pop here and there, but it hasn't really made it to mainstream. But on the flip side, the traditional way where you bring materials and you assemble it piece by piece, that is having innovation as well, where we're just seeing new materials become available. So I, I threw out the XPS and NGX example recently, or just a couple minutes ago on this call, or this panel. Um, XPS is a rigid foam. 
It was using a blowing agent that was super bad for the environment. The government realized it was super bad. The government said, you're no longer allowed to use this blowing agent. Everything now is moving to what they call an NGX foam. And so as a builder, we actually don't have to do anything. We just now use the same product. It's slightly different formula on the houses, zero transition for us to do, but our government has nudged that industry, the foam industry, to decarbonize their material. Ideally, in the future, it's the same thing. We're just gonna find better and better materials to be able to assemble our homes so that the builders aren't having to decide between product A and product B. All the products that are available to them hopefully are carbon storing or, or, or low carbon, and that way we're not disrupting the whole supply chain, we're just simply augmenting it with new materials as they become more viable. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting you, you say that. My, my dad's not Italian, but he's a sheet metal worker, did HVAC work in in, a, in, in buildings. And yeah, him um, mostly in apartments. Uh, and yeah, we talk about that a lot, that his job hasn't changed much since the 60s or 70s. You know, now he doesn't have to plug in his tools now. You know, that's <laughs> that seems to be the big difference. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll leave it to him to how to decide how stubborn he is about uh, about change. But Steve, you walked us through the you know some of the the financial innovations. What are the sort of other innovations on how we build on more of the sort of physical side? Like we've heard about uh, panelization, modular homes, and so on. Yeah, well, I, um, one of the things I wanted to 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 mention was um, a few months ago, you may have seen that CMHC announced that it would be publishing a new set of standardized house plans. And I think the idea is to do, you know, multi-unit, probably small-scale multi-unit housing, which I think is a great initiative, and I, and I strongly support do, doing this. But I don't think by itself that will have much of an effect, because I don't think that's the real constraint right now, to, especially to, 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 to climate-compatible housing. I think the, I think those standardized house plans and things like that need to be complemented with much broader industry support to implement these new technologies. Um, as, as Philip said, the, 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 the industry, the building industry in Canada is, is quite fragmented. Um, a, a lot of small and medium sized companies. Uh, th th it's not easy or financially feasible to invest a lot of money in R&D. And so, uh, so I, I think there's a clear role there for governments, and in this case, we're talking about CMHC and the federal government to, 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 to provide far greater industry supports for some of these technologies. I think that um, uh, th there, is, there is a need for the, the same thing on, on retrofits, particularly of multi-unit buildings. We have a stock in Canada, and this isn't about affordability of new housing, this is about maintaining our, our housing. We have a stock of, of over three million multi-unit uh, mid and high rise um, apartments in Canada, most of which are in need of major retrofit. Um, but it's difficult and it's expensive, and the, the, the technologies uh, to, to make these buildings uh, energy efficient is there, but there's not a deep knowledge or systems to support the application of these, these technologies. And so there's, there's a, a need for this kind of um, uh, um, innovation in the system that, it's not even really innovation, it's, it's, it's support for implementing um, good ideas that are already out there. So we've heard a lot about the sort of the outcomes and need for more innovation in the system. And I know, you know, Rachel, in, in your current position at IRPP, but your sort of past jobs at the Climate Institute and, and other positions you have, I know you've thought a lot about innovation. So, you know, what are the sort of policy tools that you see or, you know, pathways forward to get to the vision that uh, both, both Steve and, and Philip have, have set out for us? Well, I can give two, maybe three examples. Um, one is the recommendation that we, we had in one of our briefs around new land, because land is a big uh, proportion of the cost. And um, what we proposed was that the federal government actually purchase land, which seemed a bit out there for, for some people when we, when we first put it on the table. But, um, but it actually makes sense because when, when the federal government uses its uh, fiscal power to purchase land, 
that land ends up as an asset on its books and therefore does not have um, uh, an impact, significant impact on the deficit. So they, they can use their power to help uh, lower the cost uh, of land for hopefully not for profit developers to provide affordable housing um, and, and help enable this, uh, this plan. And the interesting thing is they already have uh, land management through the Canada Lands Company. And the Canada Lands Company is enabling some very innovative housing projects, some of which are indigenous led. I think you referred to them in your report, Mike. Um, and so it has this capacity already. And so expanding the Canada Lands Company, adding some lands to its portfolio is not a huge stretch. And it could be done with very little impact on uh, the deficit. Now the other piece in terms of those innovative types of builds, um, I would look to the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So the Canada Infrastructure Bank has committed uh, $5 billion, I believe, for green infrastructure. But housing is green infrastructure. It is very long lived. It's gonna be around here until 2050. And we can make it green, and it can be green um, both in terms of being homes that um, you know emit less, but also if if we allow them to be um, battery storage for our grids, if if they are producing energy, all of these things um, can make this housing infrastructure to be part of the solution, and therefore definitely green infrastructure. Now, Canada Infrastructure Bank requires a revenue stream um, for most of their projects right now. We could adjust their mandate, but. Um, there is a big benefit to utilities, as we've been, as we've been talking about, in terms of having this, this grid management there. So why not have that as a potential revenue stream that can make this a viable project for Canada Infrastructure Bank? And then the last one I will say is um, energy service companies. I think um, there's a lot of innovation happening there, and we're seeing some of this in the US. There's a company in the US that is taking on the utility bills of homeowners themselves. So they pay the utility bills. And then they invest in the energy inf efficiency and all of, all of the uh, investments to, re to reduce energy use, and they get the benefits themselves. So the homeowner does nothing. Uh, they don't have to deal with it. They don't have to deal with the upfront costs. They don't have to get loans, all of those things. This company is doing it all themselves, and, uh, and it seems to be working. So if we can enable things like that, hopefully uh, we can get to that solution with a lower cost. So I'm going to do something a little unfair to my, my, my panelists here, but I'm the moderator, so I, I, I feel entitled to do it. So you know, our, our last final question is why we build. And, you know, we frame that in our report about, you know, making sure that there's uh, housing uh, available and attainable for for everyone in Canada, regardless of their age or income level or so on. So we can, we can certainly talk about that one, but one thing, like we, we've kind of had a lot of interesting ideas out there and uh, I'm gonna open this up to the panel and each of you can give me two minutes and you can sort of volunteer who wants to go first. What aren't we talking about? Like what, what idea do you have that you wanna sort of put out there um, that hasn't been part of the discourse yet. Does anybody want to go on that question? Yeah, Rachel. So, and again, we got uh, two minutes for each of you because I want to get to uh, Q and A. <laughs> well, I, there's two things I think that we tend to leave out of the discussion. Um, and one is air pollution, and the other is traffic congestion, and those are part of building better cities, better uh, communities. Um, we need to start thinking about that. I mean, the, the, there's new studies coming out all the time about the terrible effects of air pollution, um, you know, on children, on cognitive effects, on, on our health. So, you know, a lot of these solutions address the air pollution side of things too. And, you know, we did mention smoke earlier, increasingly a concern for, for health uh, too. So. Um, if that can be part of the conversation, it'd be helpful. And then the traffic congestion side of things. We know that traffic congestion is a huge cost, it's a drag on the economy, um, it's a drag on our, our own time to be stuck in traffic. So, you know, having more public transit, having house, uh, uh, higher density housing that's close to public transit, 
it's going to help ease that traffic congestion problem as well. So if we can think about all of these policy challenges together, hopefully we can end up in a better place. So we've got air pollution, we have traffic, and obviously that uh, helps with affordability uh, as well. So Steve, I see okay, you. I, I'm going to add two more. Two more. Um, okay. One of them is a tough one to sometimes that we don't want to talk about, uh, but it is um, we, we are very, very overhoused as a nation. The average size uh, uh, square footage of a house per person in Canada is second or third highest in the world. Only second, I think, to the United States and maybe Australia. Um, a full third more than, than uh, most countries in, in Europe, for example, and, and double that of most of the rest of the world. Um, we, we, uh, I think we need to seriously consider policy changes that, as a minimum, are more neutral to this overhousing question, but ideally uh, encourage us to stop overhousing ourselves. Um, things like, and, and this is the sort of third rail of housing finance policy, the, the, um, the, the tax-free capital gains needs to be looked at, I, I believe. I, and, and I know why it's not. I was going to say, that could get you kicked I, out of I the know, government I, caucus if you say that. I know. I know you're not know, a member but, of parliament, so but you I'm, can say I, these I things. Know, I, exactly. But I think there, there will be a time when politically this becomes something that we're, we need to start to talk about. It's, we're not there yet, but there will be a day when we, we are, and I think we need to think about how and why we would do this and what we would replace it with, perhaps, if, if it's too, too much of a stretch to just eliminate that immediately. I think there needs to be policy thinking about, about that, that, that issue because it leads to outcomes that collectively are not good. Um, the other one that I wanted to raise is um, we, we are, and we kind of touched on it earlier, but the, um, uh, I think we are exposed to much, much more risk, especially related to flooding than we understand. And we're creating enormous moral hazard in our system because right now that risk is not being properly absorbed through, through pricing mechanisms. Uh, so um, th we, we, we saw a, about a month ago, Desjardins announced that it would no longer be providing mortgages on the highest risk flood um, areas uh, that, that they, they deal with. Um, I think that's just the thin edge of a bigger wedge. I think we're gonna start to see, in addition to not being able to get property insurance, we're gonna see um, larger and larger parts of the country not being able to get uh, uh, mortgages. When that happens, governments will have to step in to underwrite this risk, which puts more risk into the public domain and the, into the public sector and is creating moral hazard. We need to have a serious public conversation about this issue be so, be before it erupts into something really, really bad. So I don't usually promote other people's podcasts, but the, the <laughs> podcast Odd Lots today actually has a fantastic episode on uh, flood risk and insurance. Uh, it's a, a podcast put out by Bloomberg. So highly, highly recommend that. So we've got number three is the uh, capital gains exemption on primary residents. Number four uh, is flooding and insurance. So, so Philip, and it doesn't have to be two, but it can be if you want it to be. So the... Four on the table are actually really good ones that got stolen. So um, <laughs> I think one that always comes up, and it's it's a lot of conversation that ends up happening with our marketing team or customer service team or whichever group interacts with potential home buyers, and it's it's purely just education. A lot of Canadians they don't really understand all of housing. They know they like to live in a house, whether it's an apartment or, or a big house. But when they come to buy from anyone, um, it's a big decision. It's by far the largest purchase that anyone typically makes. And you have a lot of emotions and you have a lot of things to decide. And, and then you get thrown all this stuff about sustainability or affordability. Like all this stuff all of a sudden becomes a bit overwhelming at the point of sale uh, when you're trying to make one of the biggest decisions of your life. And so we find that education is really key to us having a more successful experience with our home buyers, because if they come to our, our, our sales offices or to our teams with questions and have already had a bit of a primer, it's a much different conversation than trying to introduce them to a concept at that point where they're like, oh my God, I'm about to buy a, 
X dollar house. Um, and so I think education is, is a paramount one that's gonna help us hopefully level all conversations across affordability and sustainability. You know, I think sitting in this room today, a lot of us have heard the term heat pump because it's been in the news so much over the last two years. But if you go back five years, like the average Canadian probably didn't know what a heat pump was. And it's just because it's been put in their face 20 times over the last two years that now they're like, oh yeah, it's like a better air conditioner, right? And it can do some heating too. Like it's, is that what it is? And it's like, yeah, for the most part. So I feel like having these conversations, having this out there into the general public so that it's it's more, I would love someone to come into our sales office and goes, what's your Energuide rating? We talked about a number, like it exists for low rise part, part nine buildings. It's an Energuide rating, Enercan has it. It's a number that tells you how energy efficient your house is. Barely nobody, if not nobody comes into our sales offices and asks, what's your Energuide rating? We could provide it, it's not a mandatory number right now, so majority of builders don't do it, but that education's not there. They just don't know to ask. Okay, so we got education. So we got uh, five things, five's the best number. Uh, so let's uh, let's go to the Q&A. Do we have any uh, questions either online or, or in person? Yep, so I think we have microphones here. So uh, yeah, ah, yes. This is from our live stream audience. Jeremy asks, what is the climate cost of all the urban teardown and rebuilding of very large infill homes taking place in cities across Canada? And are there policies needed to reduce those climate impacts? Ooh, good question. Anybody want to tackle? I don't have a number on the cost, but um, certainly one of the things that we heard a lot about when we're talking about low income housing is that um, pr protecting and preserving the older buildings for low-income housing is a key part of that affordability story. Um, and, you know, so it's always depends on the building and the location and, and all of those complex things, I'm sure, as to whether it makes sense to tear it down and rebuild or not. But but hopefully we're, um, we're protecting and may, where it makes sense to do so, renovating and preserving the affordable housing that we have. And then, you know, if it does come to replacing it, um, hopefully it's replaced with something that is more sustainable, more energy efficient, more resilient, and more, um, more or the same affordability. I don't have any stats or, 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 or numbers on that, but um, I do want to reiterate something I said earlier, which is that one of the one of the th things that we need to be doing um, on 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 um, existing multi-unit buildings is not tearing them down, even if it costs the same to retrofit. You're better to retrofit and leave that concrete structure in place rather than tear it down and build a new one. So it, it's not ideal, it's not perfect, but it's better than 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 tearing down. We don't do a lot of deconstruction of those, but I, the only thing I'll add to it is, you know, one of the sentiments I always communicate internally is the cleanest energy is the energy we don't use and the cleanest carbon emissions is the ones we don't have to emit. So obviously those buildings exist, the carbon's already being emitted. So tearing it down and replacing it with more carbon is, you know, in the wrong direction, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'm going to go to being a panelist now. You know, I, I think one of the things that we're seeing that is more of a, a future solution than a, than a past one is uh, apartment designs that incorporate uh, circular economy type approaches where uh, the, the buildings are actually has an inventory of every sort of component and are designed in a way to be easier disassembled so that way when they outlive their future use some of those parts could be reused so you're not losing that that embedded carbon. Uh, so we'll go here for the next question. I think we'll just cross back and forth. Um, my question is very quick, um, and it's actually for the audience. We were asked some questions during the panel, and this is from my own understanding, uh, because it came up in my corner over here. I just want to know, by raise of hand, um, how many of us, so don't be embarrassed, myself included, have not been in a position to purchase a home yet? And keep your hand up if you feel like probably not ever. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, ask and find and confirm what I thought was going to be true. Um, I would love to be in one of your sales offices one day. Probably won't. <laughs> it's not really a question, but if you wanted to comment, yeah. I, I, I did want to make a comment. Um, a little bit further to my comment about, um, about 
uh, tax-free capital gains. Uh, I think a good housing finance system is a system where people are indifferent financially between owning and renting. I know that's a controversial thing to say, but, uh, but we used to have that system. 40 years ago, that's the system we had. Um, we don't anymore. Um, you, you, you can't have, for home ownership housing, you cannot have housing that is a good investment and is also affordable. For it to be a good investment, it has to increase in value faster than inflation. For it to be affordable, it has to be the same or less than inflation. You can't have both at once. You have to choose. Uh, we've chosen what we've chosen, which I believe is the wrong choice. The only add-on I'll maybe make to your, your question is that we do a lot of research on demographics and priorities and, and how what's the sentiment of our, of our buying pool and the generation that you just probably asked to raise their hand. A couple years ago, sustainability was always like a top three, top two, I want a sustainable home. When I'm gonna buy one, I want it to be green. Now that's not necessarily top two or top three, it's starting to be middle of the pack and number one is always, it's not affordability, the term we see, it's access. They want access to a house and that is by far the priority. So it's very top of mind and, and to your point, it's, it's a very difficult thing for a company that for its entire history has had a, a business model that's been trying to produce homes at market rate and market rates have now surpassed your, your first time home buyer threshold. And you all just add something to that too, as someone who has um, children who <laughs> in their 20s who are saying, you know, how I'm not going to be able to afford a home ever. What is my life going to be like? Is it, you know, how does that going to look compared to to what what you had? And um, it's very tough. And and you see this in the polling now, and in the there was a happiness index that came out yesterday saying that um, people under 30 in Canada are less happy than they have been in the past and than in other countries. We're 58. <laughs> 58. Yeah. So. But to be fair, there's like 200 countries, but still 58. It's it is a big issue in Canada, and we and that dichotomy I talk I spoke about at the beginning, where you have these sort of older wealthy homeowners on one side and then the younger kind of lower income people on the other side this it's this polarization and um re growing resentment and it's something that we we really need to address and hopefully we address that by presenting a vision of of what cities look like in the future that has a, is a better life right that it's it's not just a box over your head it's um, it's a lifestyle that is appealing and enjoyable and affordable. Um, and maybe it's different, but uh, it has to be a positive vision of the future. That's fantastic. Well, we'll uh, go to the next question. I actually have a Twitter thread on that. So if you find me on Twitter, you'll see my, my thoughts. I have many of them. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much for all of your insights. It's been fantastic to have them. Um, my question is kind of a, a who slash how question, and it relates to avoiding lock-in, um, both geographically, we talked about floodplains, uh, wildfire, and technologically with, um, you know, if you install, let's say, a more efficient but natural gas um, furnace versus a heat pump, like those sorts of things, who, where do you see the intervention happening that we can avoid as uh, lock into inefficient, um, things where there's a lot of inertia where, you know, this housing stock only turns over every 50 to 75 years. Um, so, so that's, that's one big thing. And I notice like, if you care to comment on the Ontario energy boards, um, decision, um, I'm going to throw that one out if you're feeling controversial, um, because that's a big one for those new natural gas hookups. Um, that is, um, that was, the financing for that would have been uh, amortized over 40 years, I believe, and they decided to try and make it upfront, and the government of Ontario has nixed that. So you, your comments would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I was gonna say, anyone wanna tackle that one? Last or, or either of them. <laughs> Um, this is a tough question. Well, I mean, I can talk. Uh, I haven't looked at the decision in detail, other than what I've I've read in articles. But but this is a big issue, right? So, uh, you know, if we look to the future of how we phase out uh, fossil fuels over time, 
um, we have that shrinking consumer base, right? So for natural gas utilities, if they have fewer people that are buying their services, they're going to have to increase rates or, or they're not going to be profitable. Um, or viable even. So the, the, the proposal was to have the, all the, the costs um, brought, as opposed to having to, to pay for, for the, the natural gas hookup costs over, over time, was to have those all uh, in the upfront cost. But that would have increased the cost of homes. Um, which, from, from an economist's perspective, I think it's, it, it's fair to have that comparison between a house that doesn't have natural gas and a house that does have natural gas to have all that cost up front because that's that's to me a, a fairer comparison. So, um, but but I also understand that increasing the cost of the home um, could be a challenge. So maybe the solution is is building homes that are not connected to natural gas. Um, Eighty-five percent of Quebec households do not have natural gas. Yeah. It's not like it can't be done in a northern cold climate. They're right next door to Ontario. So to maybe answer both your questions, um, we all have a goal of being net zero by 2050. Um, that's 26 years away. So the houses we're building today certainly should be net zero by 2050. And so to your lock-in question, um, you can go all electric today and meet that requirement. You can do it inefficiently with a regular home. You're just going to be using more electricity. Um, or you can try to avoid some of that locked-in commentary where, for example, we're starting to look at houses that you put insulation underneath the basement slab. That's not something most retrofits are going to do. Changing windows, sure, that's easy, but breaking out a concrete basement and putting insulation and then repouring concrete, like you're just not going to do that. So there are certainly things we can do today in the housing stock that are locked in, won't change probably for the existence of that home. But keep in mind, if you put in, for example, a building code double pane window today, that's probably a good window compared to single pane. If you rip those out in 15, 20 years, like you're now just chucking that carbon back into the garbage. So once again, like we're trying to make all those decisions to be net zero ready by 2050. Um, but it is it is tough because supply chains and cost and affordability, all that stuff comes into play. And on on the the OEB stuff, it's it's interesting for us to sit as a developer watching this unfold because we've done gasless community so far in Mattamy. Um, it's possible, it's doable, we've done it, we're doing it more as we speak. Um, and we have relationships long-standing with both electricity companies and, and Enbridge. And you're right, like they're in a very interesting position right now where if you're net zero by 2050, that means pretty much no combustion in the house by 2050. So how do you amortize infrastructure for beyond 2050? Uh, uh, I'm not answering that question. I don't know the answer to that. But <laughs> um, uh, uh, th th there are ways, though, to um, to create uh, financial incentives to avoid lock-in or to encourage climate-compatible, energy-efficient housing. Um, uh, it, 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 it would not be. It's not difficult to uh, to build in the uh, an energy efficiency rating to the capital that is required for uh, mortgage loans, for example. And you can affect the price of those mortgage loans uh, if, you, if you change the valuation of the, of the asset and the capital weight put on the uh, attributes of that asset. That's quite feasible. Um, we do it for other things. Why couldn't we do it for energy efficiency or other climate um, uh, reasons? The answer is we could. We just haven't developed the will yet to, to do this. But I believe it's it's coming. Are we getting the hook here, or do we have time for? We got one more. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, quick question about about robotics. Uh, I see real progress and rapid progress in many areas of robotics and people building houses with automation. So, what do you guys think about that as far as lowering the cost as as things go move forward? I'm assuming that's that's a question for yeah. me. Um, the robotics is fascinating for me, just as as a recovering engineer to see what they're doing. Um, the the robotics, though, it's it's in my opinion, it's still in that um, what's the part of the curve? Not 
growth, but kind of like startup phase where it's not at scale to be a mass production solution. Like we build thousands of homes a year. They just simply wouldn't be able to keep up with our production as of today. And also what's interesting is a lot of those robotics, um, they end up using typically more cementitious uh, materials and the concrete association, they're doing fantastic work trying to decarbonize their materials. But once again, it's just around the conversation of, you know, what materials are we putting in? How can we do that? The most effective for carbon. So, you know, we're trying to reduce our concrete usage right now. And, and so a lot of the autom autonomous um, machines that I've seen tend to be a bit more on that side. So for right now, for a production builder, it hasn't made sense to try and do, but I've been fascinated by the development and I think there could be something in the future, just um, time will tell.